Thank you very much indeed. I may be described as a genealogist, but actually my background is 13th century state finance, which is why I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I usually work in parchment and Latin. <laughs> so it's a bit of a surprise to be talking to you about identity, culture and roots in the digital age. I think it's taken as a given that today we operate online far more than ever before, and particularly going back 10 years when Who Do You Think You Are first shone the media spotlight on the power of identity to define who we are by where we've come from. And I want to explore some of the ideas that Professor Spector has actually introduced about the power of ancestry over who we are today, particularly in the way we start to transform our identity into memory for future culture. Because, of course, today we interact with each other in a very different way to those of our ancestors. How many of you have a Facebook page? Most of you, if not all. How many tweet on a regular basis? Not so many. Okay. How many of you upload your photographs and other pieces of personal memorabilia to the internet so that you can share it with friends and family? Again, quite a lot. This is now the medium by which we form and share our personal identity. And so the whole sense of online communities forming up around individuals so that we can work out the mood of a city on a particular day, such as with the recent death of Baroness Thatcher. All sorts of variant opinions coming out, mainly expressed through social media. This is the resource that future historians are going to look at when trying to work out who we are. Yet, of course, it was very different in the past. And we used a much older version of communication to form opinions of who we are. This is the job of the historian to sift through the paper record, the archive. This is the power of who do you think you are. This is why so many people start tracing their roots. Again, quick show of hands. How many people have done a little bit of light touch genealogy and tried to connect themselves with ancestors? More than I thought. Because it tends to be an older person's prerogative to spend time in an archive, or increasingly online these days, whiling away the hours tracing long dead people so they can bore their grandchildren <laughs> about what life used to be like. I say bore because that was the impression that people formed when Who Do You Think You Are first came onto our screens. One reviewer was moved to write, this is nothing short of self-indulgent navel-gazing. It's frivolous. It's not a proper activity. Yet I would argue it's one of the most important activities you can do. Connecting yourself to your genetic past, but not just through a linear connection with a family tree of gathering together lots of names that take you back generation by generation. For me, who do you think you are, coupled with the rise of online access to core data sets, has transformed the way we see ourselves and the communities from which we have come from. Because it's now a journey. It's a journey into a landscape that sh still shapes us today. This sense of the power of who we are by being connected to people whose genes, as we've heard, will shape the way we grow up and form. But also the experiences that they had. Perhaps some of the latent talents they've passed down through your family tree are things that you might want to pick up on and explore. And then perhaps share with your online communities. This fusion of personal identity with the communities we work in today is being transformed by the technology in the digital age. The technology can be used to start to trace our ancestry through DNA profiling, for example. Working out roughly where we might have come from many hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, and start to look at deep ancestry. But for me, I still think it's the power of the individual that helps shape our identity. And this is why so many people do spend time working away in historic archives. And we've seen the transformational power of some of this. It doesn't have to be two or three hundred years ago, or find some scandalous ancestor that murdered another one of the family and then was sent off to Australia, clapped in irons on a transportation vessel, as so many of our celebrities seem to find out, and strangely seemed delighted to discover as well. 
They don't feel like they've had the full who-do-you-think-you-are experience without a little bit of scandal thrown in. But it's quite often those stories very close to home, time-wise. Did anyone see one of the first programmes that went out, Bill Oddie? His story, for me, encapsulates why genealogy, identity and roots are powerfully packaged up we wanted to tell the story of the Industrial Revolution through his ancestors. Really good story. We found a lot of his distant Oddie relatives living in the 18th century, in fairly rural communities, owning small tracts of land, but also doing a bit of weaving on the side, as so many people did, to supplement their income. They moved across gradually in the 1820s, from Yorkshire to Lancashire, crossing the border, and found themselves sucked into the Industrial Revolution, the cotton mills, a really tough, new way of life, a sea transformation in the family's fortunes. They were affected by events halfway around the world in the 1860s, when the cotton famine was brought about by the American Civil War and the blockade of the southern ports that stopped the raw cotton moving into the northwest factories. They faced unemployment, starvation, they took the difficult decision to uproot the family and move in search of work, eventually settling in Rochdale and rebuilding the family fortune. So on, generation after generation, wedded to this industrial past. Until we get to Bill, the first member of his family to leave this behind, go to university, get an education, and inevitably become a TV presenter. That was our story. His story was very different. He wanted to focus one generation back on what happened to his mother. She suffered from mental health problems. He felt that somehow this had affected him, both in terms of his upbringing, but he wanted to connect this to his own difficulties, which were very similar to those displayed by his mother. Was there a genetic link? Was it nature? Or was it the environment in which he had been brought up in? nurture. But he didn't know the story. So we did a little bit of delving. Now, if you have watched the show, you'll know that we take all sorts of outrageous shortcuts with the historic research process. And this is one of those moments where he turned up at an archive and was given a brown paper envelope with all the certificates in it. Of course, it takes far longer to do that in reality, but for TV purposes, it was one of those moments where the program completely transformed the viewer's impression not only of the celebrity, but of their own experience as well, and empowered them to go off and explore their roots. Because in this envelope were three simple sheets of paper. The first was the marriage certificate of his parents. Nothing new there. He knew about that. He knew who they were. He knew when they got married. What's the big deal? The second was the birth certificate of his sister, which was a bit more of a surprise because he never had a sister. And the third document explained why. It was her death certificate, aged only five days old. And this tragic death had profoundly affected the family. His mother was blamed by many of her extended family for this death. It was not her fault. It was just one of those tragic accidents that happen. But according to the wisdom of the time, the 1950s, the shock of this death, plus also postnatal depression, saw her not treated with counselling or therapy, but put into a mental institution, an asylum, where she was given electric shock therapy and taken away from the family unit for long spells, exacerbating the problems, not making them better. Bill was often brought in to see her as a cure for her. What sort of upbringing could that be? And this profoundly affected him. This revelation changed his view of his family, his upbringing, his identity. And one of the most poignant moments from all of the series we've done over the last nine, ten years is his final reflective thought as he travels back on a train, having found all of this out, where he sat there in the carriage saying, do you know what, I wish I knew then what I know now. Because I could have made a difference I could have helped my mum. I could have understood more about her problems. I could have changed my la life. This is empowering. Knowing one's identity 
knowing perhaps some of the genetic quirks or traits is important. And we're seeing this start to play itself out in the world we live in today. As so who do you think you are? And internet resources started to rise. We saw a number of insurance companies kindly offering facilities to upload your family tree as long as you uploaded information about the death of your ancestors to see if there were any patterns so they could tweak your life insurance claims and your premiums just in case there was an inherent pattern appearing there. As I said, we do use DNA to try and track people. But for most people, these super highways to the past, trying to find where we came from several hundred years ago, are no longer as important as understanding the lives that our ancestors led and the inspirational impact they could have on our lives. Searching for a musician or an artist because you feel you've got some talent there quite often inspires people to go off and follow this life's dream. Empowering people through understanding one's identity is important. But it also shows a connection with generations. Understanding how our lives have been affected by small decisions and how they differ from those of our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents, often makes us appreciate the sacrifices they made even more. And it reconnects us to our communities, be they communities we've only recently joined, or communities where our families have been based for many hundreds of years. This isn't just some sort of self-indulgent navel-gazing. This isn't just some sort of hobby or pastime. This will play itself out over the future years in new directions, we're living in a really bad economic downturn at the moment. Yet this is also the time we need to reflect on community support and spirit and start to look at how the landscape of the future may well shape up. We're moving into a digital world. We're encouraged to research online with digital data sets. We're encouraged to upload our content to a lot of these same search engines. And we're seeing people interact far more in this new world online landscape. There are benefit benefits, but there are also potential negatives as well. The benefits mean that we can start to engage a lot more. And we can actually see this technology helping the research, helping us gather this information together, to go on these really emotional journeys, not just online to pick up who we are and how we related to one another, but also to plan our visits, to walk in the footsteps of our ancestors, the 1914 commemorations for the centenary, the outbreak of the First World War, will see many of us decide to investigate what happened to great-grandparents, fragmentary letters passed back from the front, inspiring us to go and see where they fell, understanding history from the bottom up rather than from the top down, the academic view that I grew up in and started to work in. So the digital world will help encourage ancestral and heritage tourism. As we contribute our own thoughts and memories to the cultural landscape, we will become empowered and given the tools to go out and explore and contribute far more. Equally, there is a downside. By increasing access to digital records for research, we're also encouraging a very linear, name-based approach, which in many ways goes against the grain of what we've seen with programmes like Who Do You Think You Are? You're following a very linear path and you're back into that name-gathering technique. And there are also issues about the way we communicate and preserve our personal archives. Any historian who tells you that oral history isn't really worth preserving or that the memories of individuals aren't worth talking about, they're wrong. This is vitally important. Community memory is built on the memories of individuals and we have a role to play in this. But the way we do it has changed out of all recognition. In the past, our ancestors would write letters, take pictures and pass them on, send the humble postcard. But how do we communicate today? How many of you write a letter to friends and family, a bit of paper, with a pen, envelope, stamp, post box, like the gold one we saw earlier? How many of you do that regularly, once a week, say? Bearing in mind, our ancestors would do this several times a day to communicate. Anyone? Anyone at all? Nobody. So how do we communicate? Text? Email? Phone? Isn't it ironic that as the most literate, 
and technologically advanced generation in human history, our thoughts, our memories, aren't being gathered by ourselves. Who gets them? Those data companies. Data is king in the digital age. And now we're already starting to see some of the implications. We have some of the major data set providers and search engines planning for your digital legacy how long they will keep your data after you're dead, how you can write that into the provisions of your will so that it can be switched off when you want. We're also beginning to see that creep into the physical manifestation of legacy planning. The first gravestone with nothing but a name and a QR code has been erected. Well, you go along with your smartphone and you scan in that QR code and then you find all about that person's life because they've planned for it. But the important question I want to leave you with is, who owns the data? Who controls this? Bruce Willis had a problem making sure that his iTunes library could be passed on to the next generation of Willis's after he dies, because in theory it was going to be taken back by Apple. Who owns your data that you've put onto Ancestry? Is it yours, or is it the company that provides the infrastructure? Ownership of data, the preservation of the past, is up for grabs. I'm arguing that we should be preserving our thoughts, our memories, our identity, and putting it into a public sphere will allow historians of the future to assess us in a way that it's never been possible to do before. But who owns all of that content? That is the challenge that we face. Charlie Brooker wrote a brilliant TV film about exactly this subject for his Black Mirror series, where someone died and was able to be virtually resurrected by looking through all of their tweets and emails and Facebook posts. Their digital afterlife brought to light a different side of their personality. We need to start thinking about this planning. This is the way our memories will carry on, how we contribute to culture and society. But we do face this juncture History has never been more important because it impacts upon community, both online and offline. There is a potential revenue stream in personal heritage, in heritage tourism, that in many ways builds off the back of the 2012 Olympics. But the question really remains is, who controls that? Who shapes it? Is it a wonderful utopian dream of individuals contributing to community, or are we seeing the privatisation of memory and identity? The future is in your hands, or rather the future is at your fingertips. Thank you very much.